Okay, so there's another component that you're going to end up getting into a lot of the battle for integration that maybe we want to call the cross, the Abraham moment, the Job moment, the David and Adullam moment, you know, Psalm 23, but the upgrade in Christ version, which is way higher than what those guys in the Old Testament went through, really. It's kind of hard to imagine that. The Moses moment, okay. The upgrade in Christ moment, that's really the cross that's like what he went through, is that you find yourself at rock bottom. And I don't necessarily mean that your circumstances are bad. What I mean is that you have no other motive to go forward. That can happen to you at really high good times and that can happen to you at really high bad times. And as you get closer to the end of maturation, what God likes to do is stretch it. In other words, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, which is the beginning of one of Dickens' books. Um, and right now the name of the book escapes me. Um, Tale of Two Cities. Um, in your own life it's going to be like that. So he's going to pair certain circumstances in your life which are better than they've ever been something you always wanted he gives you and he pairs it with something you never wanted absolute worst so that you are like it's like a blitzkrieg it's Kailunt Kessel which is a German name for a way of um, tactical method of attack uh, like what they did in Czechoslovakia or Poland where they attack by air and they attack by land troops in a coordinated fashion so that, you know, the um, victim country didn't have a chance to fight. I mean, there was just no point in fighting it. That's kind of what happens to you. It's like getting the wind knocked out of you. It couldn't be better and it couldn't be worse all at the same time. That's the cross. God is constantly aiming at that stretch, okay? Because, and, and you can talk to any theologian about this, the perfection of God, okay, is that he unites all those qualities in himself. He unites all things in himself. The cross is exactly that. The low is our sins, the high is his thinking, and that's what pays for sin. God is all about inserting the high end of the law. And, you know, in the last increment I, you know, liken that to making love. Okay. Because it joins. This is how truth can afford to be free. God decrees truth be free. Okay, but doesn't that create a lot of injustice? The answer is yes. That's Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45, 7, 18, and 19. I didn't create a tohu wabohu, but he knew it was going to become that way because Isaiah 45, 7, I created the evil one. Okay, the word in English, it says I created evil, but the actual word there is ra'ah, and it's an adjective used as a substantive that really means Satan. Now, my pastor translated it that way, and I'm sure others have too. I mean, we all know that adjectives are used as substantives. We even do that in English. When I say, you're bad, I'm using the word bad as a predicate nominative, but it's really a predicate adjective. But I'm using it as a noun in contradistinction as in, a, you know, in the, pro, the apotheosis of the sentence. In predicate. Okay, so they had that same rule in Hebrew and Greek and pretty much every other language. 
All right, so the point is, God is out to associate, to join, to unite the high with the low. And so in your life, the goal is to take your dream come true and your worst nightmare and hook them. So that you're experiencing both at the same time. That increases the size of your soul in exactly the same manner as it increased the size of Christ's own soul on the cross. And you say, well, how do you know that's what happened? Well, that's what Hebrews 2 and 4 through, actually, off and on, Hebrews 2 through 10 tell you. Hebrews 5 in particular, what was that? Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, emata nipata, and he learned through what he suffered. I mean, it's it's phrased in various ways. You know, whoever wrote Hebrews, which definitely wasn't Paul, might have been Luke. I would put my money, actually, on Luke. Could have been Mark. Because the book of Hebrews is balanced. Its whole organization, the outline of the book, is based on Mark's gospel. Tracking it. Okay? And I started to do videos on that in the Synoptics channel. A Vimeo. Anyway, the point is, is that in the book of Hebrews, he's tracking how Christ was God. He takes on man to be lower than angels. Of course, then that means he can pay for the sins of angels. Otherwise, God isn't paid for all sin. And that would be wrong. It would be unfair to Father. And then he's, he's going through the rest of it to show, you know, this was how, especially starting in Hebrews 2, this was good for Christ. And unfortunately, in the English, the English translation is really horrible. So you don't see the points that the writer is making. And one of these days, if I live long enough, I'm going to go through Hebrews line by line and show you how it's mistranslated and how what I'm saying right now is true. Okay. But when it says, what was that? Hebrews 2.10. In the English, I think it says something like, He was made perfect through suffering. Huh? Wasn't he already perfect? Isn't that the point? He was sinless? Yes. But the translation is bad. Well, sort of bad. What it should say is that the contract was fulfilled through his suffering. Because to perfect in English, even, which is the proper translation for the Greek word teleo, means to complete a contract. In English, if I say, he perfected the contract, that means he completed it. He fulfilled it. All the terms of the contract for that person, he actually met the conditions. So when it says in, in Hebrews 2.10 that he was made perfect through suffering, Okay. That's what the, the, the idea is. He completed the contract through suffering. Well, what was the contract? What contract is the verse talking about? Because the word contract isn't in the verse. It's the verb teleo that makes you know that. Teleo means to complete a contract. It means to fulfill the terms and conditions of something and bring it to a conclusion. Okay, it could be terms of law, terms of a contract. Well, what is the writer talking about? He's talking about Isaiah 53:11. But dato yad stik. Okay, and the verse starts out me'amal nafsho. Okay, through his pregnancy labor of his soul, if you translated it properly, yire he will see. Yizba, he will be satisfied. But dato yatzdik, by means of his truth knowledge, he makes righteous. L'rabim, the people. Wa'awonatam, and our twisting sins. Hu yizbol, or hu yifki, he, um, yifki, he, he, he carried, okay? Would care would be a really good translation. He took upon himself, carried, I don't know, it sounds so vague. Okay. The point is, is that 
the Hebrews passage is talking about that that his soul was made bigger by means of our sins being imputed to him which is Isaiah 53 5 okay in Hebrews the second chapter is basically saying you know yeah he was made lower and yeah he was as it were you know lacerated with our sins he's not using the word lacerated there that's in Isaiah 53 5 Mehola. Um, but in the Hebrews passage, what he's basically explaining is there was a purpose for that, which benefited Christ directly. His soul was made big enough. Because remember, he's God-man. And the big problem for him was the excruciating differential between being both God and human in one person at the same time. Okay? That's like, how do I want to put it? One side of your body is totally perfect and able to do everything like in a nanosecond. The other side of your body is retarded. Withered. Can't move your arm very well. Can't move your leg very well. And therefore, it's like you're going through life with one side of you being just perfect and genius and gorgeous and everything and the other side of you being decrepit how do you live on the one hand you're superior to everybody on the planet and on the other hand you might as well be scum of the earth and that's exactly what he's quoting when he's on the cross when he says Elo Elo Lama Sabachthani that's Aramaic but he's quoting, um, what was it? Oh, Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 1 through 6. And I think it's verse 6. This says, I'm a worm, not a man. That's what God puts you through. Again, the primary reason is so that you can get the stretch your soul can grow to. You can know what it's like for Christ and in your own way know that your life wasn't in vain you got to have a cost which you'll need at that point he wanted the outlet outlet remember when he told the disciples i've longed to have this day and that's what hebrews 12 2 is also reflecting so you get to have that now the point of it is is you end up finding out I'm beginning to learn this, but it's real slow because I'm really retarded in my thinking. I really fight God a lot on this. You begin to find out that you don't have to enjoy in the sense of pleasure in order to really want something. And you frequently come to the very bottom of your life. In other words, the very bottom of your motives. You know, a lot of times in our motives, our motives are because we enjoy something, or we're interested, or we're distracted, or blah de blah de blah Well, what happens when all those props are taken away? What keeps you going? Okay? What keeps you going? And you find out at the bottom... What keeps you going is God. Because he says so. Because he wants it. Because he's him. And unless he takes you down to the bottom, you really don't know. You don't know how much he's grown you until he takes away the props. Abraham didn't know. Until God said, sacrifice your son. You know, it's sort of tongue-in-cheek when he says to Abraham, when Abraham's getting ready to slice his son's throat, Okay, stop, Abraham. Now I know you're willing to give up your son. God already knew that from eternity past. But he's being kind of tongue-in-cheek there. It was Abraham who didn't know. Because you don't. 
you don't know how much you love or how much you care or how much something means until you're about to lose it. I could never honestly I can't even say it now. I could never admit I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I, I could never admit that I love him. It hurts to say that. I don't want to admit it. Because I don't think it's true. And I don't think it's true because that's a good thing. And I'm terrible, so I can't be loving him. You see that? So he takes you to the bottom of your motive. And then... You find out, oh, I really do. And then you cry because it's like you don't want to admit it and it's a relief. And it's all these emotional things at once. And then you try to deny it afterwards in order to get back to normalcy. And you try to focus on something else. That's called sublimation. It's a psychological defense mechanism. A rationalization where you try to reason your way out of it. Or intellectualization, same thing. Or denial, same thing. I do that all the time. When you really love, you don't want to admit it. When you don't love, and you think, well, it makes you a good person if you do love. Then you'll say, oh, how I love Jesus. But honey, when you really do, you will not be able to admit it easily. So then God takes you to the bottom where you can't deny it anymore. Not that you're trying to deny the truth exactly. You just think it's wrong to say that. Because God deserves so much more than whatever love you got. He's so much better. You can't say I love you because it can't be true. You deserve better than I can give you. And then God say, well, yeah, but it's what you are. It's all of you loving all of me. And okay, you think it's small, but I don't. And until he takes you there, honey, you don't know. So you see, that's a reason to want to go through the process. That's a battle of integration. And the funny thing is, is there you find out it's a victory. You see, you won, you won, you do, you love me, you're integrated here, see, here's the proof. And it's really hard to live with that, because it hurts, because it's a relief. So now you understand the cross. You understand why the verses are worded the way they are. Yireh, Yizba, he will see, he will be satisfied. Pitato Yatstik. By means of his truth knowledge, he makes righteous. La Rabim. He's crying with victory. He's crying with relief. It works. All this time. And I thought I couldn't, I wasn't sure I'd make it. And here I am, and it's really okay. And it's really a victory. Like people cry when they get through a tragedy. Like after 9 11, the people who got out of the building in time. And at first they're too shocked to cry or react or anything, and then finally it hits them what they've been through. And they, don't, they just, like, ah! It could have been me. I could have died. You know, look at that guy who jumped out of the building from the 26th floor. And, of course, died by the time he hit the pavement. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody jump from a building and then hit the pavement. I have. And when I looked at the brains all over the pavement, it was in Century City, California, all I could think of was what it felt like for that person to hit the pavement. It was before the police came when I saw it. Some teenager kid.
does do you cry for a person like that? And when you finally make it, and you work so hard to get there, and you really weren't sure until it's over, and, and I made it. And part of you wants to deny it, and the other part of you can't. So all you do is cry. That's love. It's not the only expression of love, but it's when you're at the bottom, and you hit the bedrock, and you can't deny the truth anymore. That's where God takes you. It's to show that the battle of integration has been won. And then, then, and here's the important part about this. Then you begin to understand why there's no sin in heaven. That bedrock, when you see... Yes, you do love him. There's nothing that can stop it. Even though you're human. There's nothing that's going to stop it. Does it mean that you will die victorious? Very likely. Not guaranteed because it ain't over till it's over. And maybe, you know, if you lived longer, you would have gotten through it but maybe you have to die sooner for some other justice issue that demands you die sooner for the sake of the world or whatever but at least you know you got to your bedrock now that's really important to say because everybody's wondering well what's heaven like and the big thing that they're wondering is how do you how do you not sin and yet have free will and the answer is because of what you know, because of how you develop. See, Christ got there. It wasn't a game. It wasn't a rigged deck. And it really wasn't because he's God that he got there. The Catholics screwed it up like they screw up so many doctrines. The Catholic tried to explain how Christ could stay sinless by doing this. And they're using their Latin, and I'll probably pronounce it wrong because I haven't studied Latin since I was in high school. Um, Posse peccati. Okay? Posse, he can. Peccati, uh, sin. That they attributed to his human nature. And then they had a little plus. And then below that, they say non posse peccati. Okay? Cannot sin as God which is wrong, that's totally wrong a theology on that's absolutely wrong if God cannot do something then he's not omnipotent it's really pathetic how childish Catholic theology is but anyway so you add up posse peccati and non posse peccati and you take the the non from the second clause okay and stick it in the middle of the first clause and then their equation ended up being posse non peccati so therefore you don't sin okay it's a stupid explanation and it's not doctrinally correct but they didn't know how else to explain it just like they screw up the definition of the immaculate conception the immaculate conception is really easy to understand Holy Spirit did it being you're pregnant because the sin nature is coming from Adam which is what Romans 5.12 tells you. In Adam all sin. In Adam all die is also in what? 1 Corinthians 15 somewhere. Okay? So, how is it you don't sin? Well, God takes you on this journey and you grow up in the doctrine and it's because of what you know it translates into a love for God and that's your virtue that's your strength that's what you start to live on and therefore you don't sin now it doesn't mean you totally stop sinning what it means is that the sins that what do you call it beset you earlier in life they go away you're not attracted to them anymore I can't think of a circumstance 
and with certain sins that I used to sin when I was younger that I would ever do them again. They don't attract me now. Other kinds of sins attract me a lot. So I have grown out of certain sins and it, I'm not going to be attracted to lemon meringue pie. And I'm not going to be attracted to certain kinds of sins. It's that kind of idea. So God takes you round robin so that you grow out of. So that when you're dead, sin, temptation maybe is going to still happen. Because that's part of truth be free. But you're not going to want to sin. It'll be a struggle. It'll be a stretch. And you'll enjoy the victory of not sinning. See, part of the glory of God is what I like to call the glory of the unused. God can sin, but he won't. And there's a certain glory in knowing that he's free, and he can, and he won't. When you're married to your spouse, and you really love your spouse, like Jeb Bush is totally in love with his wife, it's really amazing. I haven't seen somebody be so in love with his wife in a long time. Just looking at that guy, just what? Just he's just like she's the sun, the moon, and the stars to him. He is not tempted to be with another woman. Whether he ever was in the past, I don't know, and I don't care. He's not now. She's everything to him. He can't stop bragging about her. That matters. Okay? That's the way you're going to be in the eternal state. Except your husband is God. Christ in particular, because, you know, the whole of church is called bride, so the attitude we're going to have toward him is similar to the way a woman is totally in love with man. And it's never going it, to... There are going to be all kinds of temptations. Otherwise, it's, it's not free. But there's going to be a glory in being tempted, but not given in. Anyway, i got to stop now because all my crying, I, I'm going to start coughing and I need to take medicine. Peace out.